Hey everyone, I'm Chris Lesniak. And I'm Rob Beyer. And this is the Debate Math Podcast. Debating mathy topics and mathy pedagogy with mathy people just like you. Let's get into this month's debate. So you just gave a test or a quiz and maybe some of your students did not do well on that assessment. Maybe they need more time to master the material. What's the best way forward? Maybe you're thinking of having them go through and correct their mistakes. Or maybe you want to set a date for a retake of that test or quiz. Is either option fair? What is best for the students? And with limited time as it is, if you have to pick only one path forward, what would it be? So we're asking educators in today's debate, what is the best way of demonstrating mastery? And here arguing for retakes, we have two awesome educators. And first up is a math teacher and the math PLC leader and sponsor of Educators Rising, a club to promote interest in the teaching profession to young adults, who is married and has a nine-year-old daughter and is also an avid reader and a craft beer enthusiast, Julie Seller. Hi, Julie. Hi, thanks for having me on. I'm glad to have you here. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, I live in Sugar Grove, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, and yeah, I'm a high school math teacher um, at Plano High School, which is a small high school in Plano, Illinois. And um, currently I teach uh, Algebra 1, uh, Algebra 2 honors, and a senior course called College Prep Math for seniors looking to go into college preparatory mathematics. Nice. Well, welcome. And arguing along with her for four retakes is a math coach, a featured mathematician of the day at the Minnesota State Fair Math on a Stick, and a part of the closing keynote speakers for the 2023 Minnesota Spring Math Conference in April, who has a goal of one hour a week of productive non-work, non-parent time, but is also currently a hobbyist, so she needs some ideas. It's May Vang. Hi, May. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on. I'm coming to you guys from a suburb of Minneapolis um, in Minnesota. And I was just telling everyone that we are in summer season right now, you know, 35 degrees out. Um, so what I currently do in my role is I am a charter school math coach. So I coach teachers in kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. And previously, I was a middle school math teacher. So, you know, that there's that little kid, that little 12 year old girl at heart. So <laughs> nice. Well, welcome. And now the question we want to ask all of our guests, and I'll start with you, Julie, when did math first become controversial to you? Yeah, math first became controversial to me when I first started learning about calculus back in my senior year of high school. Um, so when our teacher first told us that Newton was commonly recognized as the father of calculus, um, I learned later, a few months after we first learned that, that actually there was another guy <laughs> named Leibniz who actually discovered calculus at the same time. And published his work at the same time. And this made me realize that math can truly be controversial and not everything about math is, including its creation, is black and white. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Very good. Thank you. And then May, when did math first become controversial to you? Um, I was in like I think the third year of my teacher prep program and I was in a school doing some hours. Um, and this school, um, like me, most of the students are Hmong. And, um, you know, after finishing some hours there, one student finally asked me, he's like, so you're going to be a math teacher? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I've never seen a math teacher before. Right. And so that was the first time ever that I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize how much race and culture or even gender plays into the math classroom or learning math in general. So um, he really made me realize that my role is bigger than just being a teacher. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And welcome to you both. And we have a team of two awesome educators arguing for test corrections. First up is a professor of mathematics education with a PhD in educational psychology, the author of Rough Draft, Revising to Learn, published by Steinhaus, who taught junior high mathematics in Mesa, Arizona before she was a professor and a fan of pinball and an owner of a kayak who likes to get out on the water in the summers. Dr. Amanda Jansen. Hi, Mandy. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Can you tell our listeners uh, where you are and what your current role is? Yes. So I live in Newark, Delaware, which is spelled like Newark, New Jersey, but it's actually Newark. 
Because when they made the map to the northern part of Delaware, it was drawn with a compass to make an arc. So that's how you can remember Newark, Delaware. It's a northern part of Delaware. What was the other part of your question? What I'm doing? I'm a, I'm a professor. So I teach future teachers. I teach future elementary and middle school teachers about both math pedagogy and developing a deeper understanding of the mathematics that we need to understand to teach. Fantastic. Welcome. And arguing alongside her is a professor of math education who was a secondary math teacher for 12 years, nine years teaching in Guam, where he is originally from, and three years teaching in Washington State, who currently holds national board certification in early, early adolescent mathematics and received the Presidential Award of Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching in 2014. He loves to play tennis, read LGBTQ young adult novels, and recently, he and his partner became proud Forgy dads, Dr. Richard Velasco. Hi, Richard. Hi, thanks for having me tonight. Could you let us know where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, sure. I currently live in Oklahoma City. I'm an assistant professor of math education at the University of Oklahoma. And just as you had mentioned earlier, I was a former middle school math teacher. I taught nine years in Guam and three years in Washington State. And since then, I've just kind of been interested in helping develop future math teachers. So that's currently what I do in my current profession, but I also teach some graduate students as well. Welcome. And now the question that we ask all of our guests, uh, when did math first become controversial to you? When I was really young and learning division, I remember thinking to myself that subtraction is the opposite of addition. So we just did multiple Multiplication, there's got to be something that undo, undoes, undoes multiplication, division. And so my second grade teacher got angry with me because she said I wasn't supposed to know that because we weren't taught that yet. And then when I got into older grades, right around fourth grade, we're working on long division and I wasn't able to make the conceptual connection to the algorithm. And I got really stuck with long division. And it was only when I started to connect it with place value that I understood it. So to me, division, my experiences with division really wrapped up in kids really need to make sense out of math. And as teachers, how we can support students with making sense and not shutting them down when they're figuring things out on their own and then supporting them when the algorithms are something for them to understand. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing. And uh, Richard, for you, when did math first become controversial to you? Yeah, I started to think about a time back when I was in elementary school as well, when I was kind of harmed by mathematics, I can say, because <laughs> I've always loved mathematics growing up. I, you know, always thought I was so good at it. And especially in the early elementary years, I, you know, was placed in gate classes, which is another controversial topic for another time. Um, but then when my when I was fifth grade, we had this opportunity to be to participate in Math Olympiad. And we had to take a test to um, to be a part of it. Uh, unfortunately, I did not make that uh, that team, and it really hurt me. And I just made me feel like, oh my gosh, maybe I don't love math anymore because I didn't make this team. But eventually, I got to realize that it wasn't about me, and it wasn't about the way that I knew or did mathematics, but it was the way that the test was set up. <laughs> yeah, thank you, and welcome to you both. Okay, and with that, let's get into the debate. We begin with opening statements from each of our speakers. You each have two minutes to present your arguments. And we're starting with the side arguing for retakes with Julie Seller. Julie, you're up first and your time begins now. You remember when you took your driving test? Did you pass the first time? If you didn't, were you just allowed to point out your mistakes and how to correct them? Or did you have to retake the test to get your license? Test retakes are the most effective way to prove mastery if a student does not show mastery on the first attempt. Even though I believe correction should be a part of the process and adequately preparing for a retake, I don't believe they should be the only piece up for a student to show they have mastered material. I have three warrants for this. One, corrections are a good way for students to learn what their mistakes were, as well as to identify where their areas of weakness are for a retake. The retake is then the real proof that they have mastered the material and truly learned from their mistakes. Two. We learn how to be better test takers with practice. Some students are poor test takers by nature, and they will only get better with practice. By allowing retakes, we are helping them practice test taking skills while at the same time proving that they have learned and mastered the material that they didn't master the first time. Three, there will be times students need to recall previously mastered material without the use of notes, such as cumulative exams, 
and state mandated standardized tests. However much we hate those, they still have to not use notes on those. Corrections alone, which usually allow a student to use notes and get help from a teacher, do not ensure that they will be able to recall the material later on when they don't have notes available to them. The act of recall is important for showing mastery of material in mathematics, and retakes help students improve their recallability in a testing situation. Thank you, Julie. And now we are going to hear on the side arguing for corrections with Mandy. Mandy, you have two minutes, and your time begins now. So my claim is that both students and teachers benefit when students are asked to correct their own tests rather than retaking a similar type of test. Math teachers should provide students with opportunities to correct their tests, but also during the process of corrections, um, students should have the opportunity to reflect on the errors they made, as well as reflect on why their new solutions are improvements rather than moving only toward the retaking of the test. So I have four warrants that I'd like to share. One, the first one is that reflecting on your errors carefully supports, uh, reflecting on errors supports math learning. In the process of reflecting on the error, students deepen their understanding of the nature of that error. And then that makes students less likely to make those mistakes in the future because they can anticipate that potential error. So then my second claim is more specifically when students are reflecting not just on any error, but their own error that they made on an exam or test. They experience a more personalized approach to math learning. Students are learning from the specific mistakes that they have made, and they develop metacognition about their thought process to anticipate their own errors. The third warrant is that when students reflect on their errors, teachers get access to students' thinking about their own work when they're reflecting on their error or mistake because students can make errors for a number of reasons. One, they may not have understood the directions. And so then the teacher could then improve future exams. Or maybe the student made a calculation mistake, but still has a deep understanding. Or maybe students didn't understand the concept. So having access to those reflections is really useful for the teacher. And then another, my last warrant is that for teachers, the extra grading is easier for a teacher if students are doing test corrections rather than retakes, because you've already graded those problems previously. So that's my argument for why we should have test corrections instead of retakes. Thank you. And now we'll hear again from a team uh, promoting retakes with May Vey. May, you have two minutes and your time begins now. So when I ask students to demonstrate mastery, I'm asking them to show flexibility with the concepts and to show and apply in um, complex situations and unfamiliar situations. But before students can reach a mastery level, they're going to make mistakes. Right? But it's my job to support them in what to do with these mistakes. Um, and so that's why I think retakes is a great way for me to support students. Not only do students get to re-show mastery or get a chance to show mastery, they also have to really understand my feedback deeply to know what to do and how to improve themselves as learners. And so my three claims, uh, my three warrants behind my claim is that one, as a longtime middle school teacher, my students are showing up in my, in my classroom knowing that they are good at math or not good at math. Um, so by giving them a chance to do retakes, I feel like I'm giving them a chance to build their confidence. They can tell me that, hey, I wasn't quite ready yet, and I just need a little bit more time. Or wait, you're in this current unit connected the ideas for me, so now I really understand it. Can I retake it? Um, and it allows them to know that, hey, I'm learning from their mistakes right now is just as important as getting it done the first time correctly. Um, the second claim is that it allows me the chance to see students grow. I get to collect that data and get to see, hey, this student wasn't getting mastery level understanding at this point, but, you know, how long did it take to get for them to get there? If they, you know, whatever time it took, they still got there. So I get to see their growth along with being able to use that as a talking point for them and with their family say, you know, this is where your student was and look at where they got to. Um, even though it took a couple of weeks or though it took a second or third try, you know, I'm seeing their growth and I'm seeing that they're understanding what we're doing. And the third thing is that retakes tells them that learning doesn't end. It tells them that, you know, when you want to master it, you're still going to grow. When you want to move yourself from not learning it well to learning it well, you're going to grow. And I'm going to value that growth and I'm going to value at any point that you want to grow. Thank you. And finally, arguing again for corrections, we have Richard. Richard, you have two minutes and your time begins now. 
So I'm here today to debate the following resolution. What is the best way of demonstrating mastery? And my claim is that students should be allowed to make corrections to their test. And because of this, I have three warrants. Uh, so one, as the saying goes, mistakes are our best teachers. By allowing students to correct their test errors, they have opportunities to identify where in the process they made the error and understand what was incorrect about it. Um, neurological scientists and psychologists have found that awareness of mistakes and consciously tending to them helps spark synapses in the brain to help it grow. So with this brain growth, students are less likely to make that same mistake in the future. Two, allowing for test corrections shifts the focus to mastery learning from procedural memorization. Many math tests force students to memorize algorithms, equations, etc. By allowing students to correct mistakes to a test, students are alleviated from the pressure to memorize for another test and would be more focused on pinpointing and addressing where in the process they have actually made their errors. And finally, three, test corrections help to minimize test anxiety present in a lot of our students, particularly in references to grades. This notion is especially true for students who have been marginalized in oppressive systems in which they are currently faced uh, or placed, sorry. Many students already face academic pressures about grades from home, society, or even themselves. Teachers who allow students to make test corrections that allow students to improve their test score fosters a safe space for their students and frees them from that pressure of risking getting the same or lower grade if they have to retake a test. As you can see, allowing students to make corrections to their test is warranted. We claim, or I claim, that teachers allowing test corrections for their students is the best way to demonstrate mastery. We hope you'll vote on this issue. Wonderful. Thank you all. We already started off with four amazing uh, statements there. I, if someone is is not someone, a teacher is someone who doesn't give any kind of retake or corrections at all, I think you've given some really good, uh, thoughtful reasons why they should at least consider something in there. And I see lots of common ideas of you all like believe the students might not get it yet. I hear the word yet out there a lot. And, and the idea of mastery, wanting students to show mastery and it doesn't have to be the very first time that, that they come across something. Um, so I, I guess, let me start with a, a logistical question here. What is the, the, the time it's going to cost a teacher, um, to either go for test corrections or test retakes, like how much extra work and time will it take up? And what is your advice for teachers on that? If it someone who's never considered any of these things before, I start with maybe Julie or May on team retakes. So I can just say for me, um, all of our kids at our school have a common win period, it's called. It's basically a common study hall. Um, so not every kid's obviously required to do corrections and a retake. Um, it's just the kids that score below a thir certain threshold that I pretty much tell them they should be coming in to do a retake and do the corrections. Um, so I do have like an, it's actually our school policy that we have a th certain threshold that kids must reach to not have to do a retake. So in our department, it's an 80%. If you got an 80% or above, we're not going to make you do a retake. Um, so it's those kids that score lower than that 80% that we would require it. So it's not like the whole class is coming in to do a retake. Um, and then it would happen during their win period that they would come in, do the corrections. And then and after they do the corrections, we talk through a couple of things. They take a similar test to the one that they just took. So that this doesn't take up any class time um, of actual instructional time in the class. All of this needs to be done outside of the class time. We do have at my district um, that nice win period that kids can come in, but I'm sure other places don't have that option. So that would be something the teacher would have to consider when they take this sort of policy on. Okay. And May, anything you want to add? Yeah. As a middle school teacher, um, I feel like my students aren't always really good about, you know, bringing themselves in to take their own retake. And so I build it into my class time. So like Fridays on days where I have either like problem solving days or days where I'm not the one teaching, they're doing their own small group work. That's when I do pull kids and say, hey, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be working on. Are you ready for it? If you're not ready for it, let's work on it together. Um, and so it, I think it really depends on the age of your students, but also the structure of your school time and and also philosophy around what testing is, you know, and how you test. You know, as a school, we were standard based grading. Um, and so te and so grading was a lot smaller because we were grading it holistically versus looking at it point by point. And then same to Mandy and Richard is like, how much time do you envision teachers spending like helping students with their with corrections or looking through all the reflections and corrections. And then what does that look like for a teacher? 
So I used to teach middle school math and now I teach adults. And one of the things I'm thinking about when we think about time for teachers is um, when I would think about retakes, I would have to write a whole nother test that was similar. And it's hard to write good test questions the first time. And then making sure that new versions of the test would be similar to the older ones in terms of both the goals and the level of difficulty. I, um, I was thinking with test corrections, it's a, it gives me time to really focus on the students thinking and reading those reflections rather than the writing of the new test itself. So that's one thing I thought about. Uh, I have a similar idea as well as a former middle school math teacher. I, I've done both. I've done both ha having students retake a test and do test corrections. And I'm, I find that it is more time consuming to have to retake the test, not just for the student themselves, but also the teacher having to recreate that test. And then I also think that it kind of takes away from the students being able to, to do that learning that's in the classroom. Um, so for me, it just seems a lot easier in terms of convenience with time to have them redo or correct their test mistakes. It gives them the opportunity to um, kind of see, you know, where that knowing that there is like hope to go above the grade that they already got so that there's no, there's no way that they can get to like a lower grade anymore. So I think for them, that's just gives them a little bit more time to kind of catch up to that. So I, I'm glad that you brought up the, the conversation about the grade. Um, I was on an interview once and I had a superintendent ask me about this idea of retakes uh, versus, you know, test corrections. And like, how do we account for a grade? So like for, for retakes, like how does the original grade factor in? And then for corrections, like how many points do they earn back? Do you give half credit? Do you get full credit? Like those, those are two different conversations that we have for somebody wanting to do one or the other. So I'm going to actually start with Julian May. Uh, like, how do you account for the original grade uh, when they do a retake? Yeah. So for me, the original grade, they can't get lower than that original grade. So they also only have to retake parts of the test they didn't master the first time. So it's not like they're retaking the entire test. If they just were struggling with two concepts on the entire test, that's what brought their grade down. They just have to redo those two parts. Um, so the way that this works out, because I said there was like that threshold of 80 percent, the, the highest grade a kid can earn back on a retake is 80 percent. So they can't score higher than kids that reached mastery the first time around. There's that kind of carrot to for those kids that are doing really well in class that you're going to get that grade that's higher than 80 percent. Nobody's going to go above you that took it a second time. So you're not getting an added advantage for taking it a second time, but you're also not going to hopefully fail the class because you had a really bad test to start off the class. Um, so that's my piece is they can't score lower. So there isn't that risk of if I take it again, I got a 75%, I could actually get a 60. That's that kind of would throw some kids off. Um, and at the other part of it, the highest they can ever get is that threshold. So they can't get 100% on their second try after seeing it one time. Um, I don't give that sort of grade out. May? Um, so being a school that adopted standard-based grading, I mean, we're not 100% fidelity with standard-based grading, but um, the philosophy is that you replace the grade with the best grade because that's the level of mastery students have shown. Um, so you can't get lower and you are only taking certain parts of the test, just like what Julie said. Um, in addition, though, we do allow students to go from a mastery to extending beyond mastery. So we do allow the 100 percent if you're if you want to top percentages, because some students are like, well, I knew it now, but then I was able to make some connections. And so I want to go back and show it that I was able to connect it on a higher, deeper level. Um, and so and then I think, again, middle school, you know, like their grades unfortunately don't really count towards like high school graduation or college entrance, but um, we still want to show them that we want to honor what they know. So by allowing them to reach beyond mastery is okay with us. And uh, Mandy and Richard, for you, like how do the uh, points factor in? Do you give half points back, full credit? Like how does that work out? I think this is great that we're discussing different models because I don't think there's obviously None of us think there's one right way to do this. So I'll talk about how um, the corrections are currently working in the in a math class I teach. I teach a class that's all about uh, math content knowledge for teachers around fractions and proportional reasoning for future elementary teachers. And we do quiz corrections and then exams that they don't get to do any corrections on. And so we take these quizzes that are worth fewer points than the exam 
And they can earn up to all the points back because it's not as much of their grade. But then that reflection around those errors in the quizzes helps them um, anticipate future possible errors that they might do on the exams that are worth more points. And so it has this benefit of the corrections aren't going to dramatically affect their final grade that much, but does support, we think, their greater success on that exam later. So it's in a way you could think of the exam as a retake of some of the ideas on some of the quizzes. So um, we have to think about how we can help students, you know, reduce their anxiety for the larger exams that are worth more points and anticipate their future errors for those exams. So that's one model. And I've heard other people talk about models like if you're doing test corrections instead of retakes, you could only do maybe one or two test corrections per marking period. So not have them do every single test as a test correction. So I would say those are two options to consider. Richard? Yeah, and just again, echoing what Manu was saying, I, for me, when I, when I would do test corrections or allow test corrections for my students, I would allow, allow them to have the max amount of points that they can eventually achieve. In fact, uh, there were some tests when I actually encouraged using a pen <laughs> to take the test so that they would just kind of leave their errors on the tests. And then when they do the test corrections, then they'll have it side by side. So I can see where that process is at. So I told, I encourage students, if you are going to use a pencil, do not erase it then, because I want to see where you found your mistakes and how you were able to correct that. So I, for me, it's arbitrary, especially having taught at the middle school, right? As May had mentioned, there's really, it doesn't go towards the graduation or anything like that. But for me, it's about, um, uplifting their efficacy uh, in mathematics and for them to actually know that they can kind of do it and still kind of achieve it. Um, so yeah, in terms of points, it's just even with these tough corrections, they're still able to achieve maximum points. And, and Richard and Mandy, I'm going to follow up and then I'll go back to the other side too. So a large conversation I have um, and you know, training teachers over the last five years and then in my new position, uh, it's always a debate about you know half point versus full credit. Like, and really kind of touched on this about, you know, not getting it the first time. And do we give, you know, only up to 80%? Do we give full credit? And then what truly are we, you know, are we assessing? Like, are we, like, does the grade matter? So the question, I guess, is like, which, which way should we go? Should, should it be like partial credit or, and, or do we give the full credit? I mean, oftentimes I hear teachers say, well, if we're true growth mindset, then we give full credit because now we're growing in, in that. But then others are saying, well, then how is it fair? Like how Julie said, like, how is it fair to, you know, kids who did it right the first time and then, you know, getting points back. So like Manny and Richard, like what would be the, the right answer here? Is there a right answer? Um, do we give half credit? Do we give full credit, uh, especially with the test corrections? And then I'll come over to the other side after. I would like someone's grade to reflect what they know, not so much when they learned it. And so if someone can, in a week, show that they know the concept, I think they should get the same grade as someone that knew it a week before, because the grade, I would like it to align with the understanding that they're leaving my class with and not have it be time bound. And uh, kind of just answering your question, Rob, I, I don't think there is a simple answer to it specifically, whether it be point five or full credit. To be honest, it's very arbitrary. It's not as important as the qualitative feedback that we can give our students and the qualitative feedback we receive from our students. And what I mean by that is allowing the students to process their correction into telling us what they actually knew or know about this. And echoing again with what Mandy was saying, and I think somebody else had mentioned this power and idea of yet, even though they may not know about the concept today, they might know it tomorrow, they might know it next week. And that is absolutely fine. Julie and May? So I think I'm the only high school teacher. <laughs> so I'm going to speak to the high school part of this. If I give A's to everybody, everybody's on the same even keel. There's no competitiveness with kids applying to college. And there's no competitiveness for the awards at the end of the year. And there's no competitiveness for anything in high school. Um, so I, I, I do firmly believe that kids should be allowed to reach up to a certain point. And I, I'm, I would love to move to standards-based grading. Like, my school still doesn't do it. So that's not even an option on the table for me right now. Because if I had standards-based grading my total viewpoint would change, but I'm still in the 90, 80, 70, 60, 50 um, grading scale. And so as of now, there is still, I need to have 
you know, the full threshold. If I was giving out A's to every kid in class, I think I would be probably talked to by my principal about making the class too easy and not competitive enough and not rigorous enough for my kids. So I'm allowing retakes up to a point because I don't want kids to fail and I want kids to show that they have mastered it. But at the same time, they eventually have to learn how to study for tests and how to get ready for them. And the only way to do that is by saying you can only reach a certain point. And now next time we need to learn how to study better. I'm going to help you get there. But this is your this is your way out of a hole. And I'm helping you get there. Um, but teaching at the high school level, there is a there is a bit of a competitiveness that I have to consider in the classroom as well as what counselors and administrators are looking for too. May. So being the middle school teacher here, I feel like it, it being time bound is really hard for students, especially because I can only control what's in my classroom, right? I can't control that they had a bad night. I can't control what happens after they leave. I can't control the fact that they have another test that day too, you know? Um, and so by allowing them the chance to reach whatever level of mastery and understanding they want to reach at any point, that's that's fine with me, you know, but we, in a way, we are time bound though, like great said we report it. So we're on a quarterly basis. And so I am bound by that end of report card grade. So if students don't do their retakes by then, their grade is what it is, you know, um, or if a student really doesn't understand it and they've done it two or three times, it is what it is, you know, but I am here to support them and I am going to control what I can in my classroom by providing them the best learning environment, even if that means it takes them a little bit more, longer than other people. All right, let's let's get away from grading here. I'm, I'm going to go back to Julie and May. I, I want to uh, follow up about like a retake. And Mandy brought up something about how like it, it's hard to write a new test, a similar thing. Like, are your retakes just like changing the numbers and kind of a like similar question, similar format? Like, how how much effort and work is going into making a retake? I think it depends on the class. Um, Algebra one, a lot of times it is just about changing numbers, to be honest. I want to keep the difficulty level the same, the concept the same for the ones they got wrong. So if, for instance, if it's exponent rules, I want to make sure that they're doing a product rule question and they're doing a question that involves a negative having to be moved um, so that it becomes positive. So I do want the same types of questions, but the same difficulty level. Um, but my college to prep math class is very real world based. So those do take a little bit more time to rewrite the same sorts of questions. Um, so it definitely becomes easier the longer you teach a course because you've created multiple versions of the same test over the years um, that you can then go back and use one of your older ones as a retake. But at, for, as a first year teacher, I could see this being a challenge coming up with multiple versions of the same test that are close to the same level of difficulty and yet still co covering the same content that the first one did. I'm really lucky to work on PLC teams where we write tests together also. So it's not just me <laughs> coming up with all the numbers or all the situations. Um, but for us being a standard-based grading school, we're also writing our tests shorter. You know, I don't need to know, a, I don't need that a student can do every kind of um, like integer operation problem. You know, if I'm showing a minus a negative problem here, I don't need, I can do it again later or I can do a different type later in a word problem or in a more difficult problem. Um, and so they are much shorter, like, you're looking at like 12 questions, you know, um, but, and so, yeah, just a lot of luckiness with where I work and we all work with a team. Nice. Yeah. I mean, like, like you both said, it's very situational based on your school, your district and all the policies. Yeah, for sure. And, and then we go to the other team. So on, on corrections, what does it look like? Are you just having them correct? Are, are they having to explain something? Are there, is there some kind of reflection? Like what other components might be involved in, in the correction? Yeah, thanks for asking that, because for me, when I think about test corrections, I really think about students revising and reflecting on that revising of their thinking. And so it's not just fix your mistake. So what I like to structure is having them first think about when you're turning in your test corrections, the first thing you're thinking about is identify why you did not get full credit on this response. And so they write the reflection about that. And then write a new, full, and complete solution, not just fix the one thing. And so then they have to write up their full new solution. And so maybe it's like the question required explaining or a diagram or something. Write up your new, full, and complete solution. And then you write your reflection on how this new solution is an improvement over your previous solutions. So in the middle part, yeah, they're writing their new solution, but they're reflecting on first why they didn't get full credit 
and then writing about why their new solution is improvement. And so for me, um, along with test corrections, it's really about that reflection experience, that metacognitive experience about identifying what's making sense, what's not making sense. In a sense, that's more important to me than the actual correction. It's that reflection on their thinking that makes a big difference, I think, moving forward. And I wanted to just uh, allude back to something I had said earlier about this qualitative feedback for the students and then from the students and emphasis from from. So when we do test corrections or when I used to do test corrections with my middle school students and even some high school students uh, when I taught high school in the States, um, we would kind of sort of engage on the, with this back and forth dialogue. Well, it wouldn't go back for, for like a really long time, but they would pinpoint where their mistake was where it's at on the test, they would make their correction, but also kind of give some um, sort of response to, you know, why do you think you did this wrong the first time? So it's very similar to what Mandy was saying about this reflection. And uh, did you learn from this? And did you um, have the opportunity to pinpoint where that mistake was? Or was it just a simple error? Maybe you were just tired during the test. And then it gives me an idea of where they were maybe coming from and why that error was made. Not that it was just like intentional on a test or, you know, was there like a lot of pressure when you were taking the test? Um, why do you think you were able to understand it now? So n- not all of those questions all at once at the same time. Sometimes I would vary it from test to test. But again, I think allowing the students to kind of give their input as if they were talking to me uh, when they hand back the test, I think was very important in terms of um, motivating them also to, to reach that mastery. Great. And I have one more question from each side. I kind of want to follow up because uh, Richard, you said in your opening something about creating a safe space for students or they don't feel the, the stress of the test is like the be all and end all at that moment of their grade. And I, I love that. Um, but I, I'll start with uh, Mandy and Richard with you guys. Uh, just thinking about um, the amount of work, like we talk about, you know, not giving students homework because they have a busy home life and they have too much work already as it is. Like, are we creating more work for students? And Kind of a related question also, is it too easy for students to have help or cheat on if they're taking this thing and doing it at home that, that is, is an assessment? Also along those lines, I think some people would say, well, the students might not really work as hard to prepare for the first version of the quiz or the test if they know that they can correct it. And so in that sense, I've actually found they don't really want to have to spend that extra time correcting. They want to get it right the first time. So so that fear wasn't really true, but I'm not an- answering the question you asked, Chris. I sort of made up my own question. Um, so can you repeat part of what you said so I can respond to your actual question? Yeah, but both wondering, like, is it fair for them to do this work like on their own at home or are they cheating? And and also, is it fair to give them like extra homework, basically, or, or, or can we expect them to find time to do all this? Yeah, so the collaborative part, I actually... I don't mind if they collaborate with other people when they're correcting tests and exams in life. We collaborate with people all of the time. So I'm not so concerned about that, but I could see someone taking a harder line on that matter. And in terms of the amount of work, yeah, we have to take into account how much work we're assigning the students. And if we really do value the test corrections, we want to make sure that the other work that we're having them do is balanced out. We could like not assign as many homework problems so they do have time for that. I do think it's important to situate it in a larger context for sure. And I think there's really no, you know, finger pointing or anyone to really blame because as I had mentioned earlier, it's just sort of like the system that they, that we are all placed in, the students are placed in, that the teachers are placed in. It was mentioned earlier about time constraints, this whole idea of time and how we need to meet deadlines. For, you know, students because of the competitiveness, that sort of mindset to kind of get the students. But I think it's a whole system, like in higher education as well, where it's like, why are we recruiting students on GPA alone? You know, we need to look at multiple measures. We need to look at more qualitative data. We need to, uh, you know, and that's easier said than done for sure. But um, sorry, Chris, I also didn't answer your question, but going back to your question and in that sense, I... You know, I actually also encourage collaboration. In fact, when I, you know, had these conversations with my students, I encouraged them, like, talk to your parents about it. Why do you, uh, maybe they can help you, you know, uh, see where you might be wrong. Yes, there might be this, um, this risk in maybe their older brother would just do it for them. But I think if we establish a safe space of trust with our students 
and showing them that we respect them as much as they respect us. I think they're more inclined to want to do it in a, in a truthful manner. Um, and again, I think what I've learned is that instead of just trying to, I, I would even argue to maybe go beyond a safe space and encourage a brave space where students feel encouraged to actually want to tackle their own mistakes on their own. Uh, but even when they come back to class and they didn't do it at home, um, I would set aside some time to like, okay, let's go work together, find a partner, or let's go work together in groups. And whether or not they sit there and copy another person's correct answers, there's still dialogue going on. There's still some form of exchange in linguistically, cognitively that's going on in that conversation. There's still some form of learning. It may not necessarily be the content that I desire, that I want, but students are getting something out of it. And then back to the other sides, uh, Julie and May, kind of similar. Like when it comes to students, are are we being fair by giving them like a similar test with new problems? Like, is it just getting easier over time? And or are we creating more anxiety? I know you mentioned like test anxiety in there. Like, are we creating more anxiety for our super anxious students by making them retake it again? Yeah, I think I think what I help with the anxiety thing, and I totally get it. I'm, I I actually grew up with a massive amount of anxiety. So I get the anxiety of big tests and everything like that. Um, but I think taking, in my sense, when I do retakes, I take away the anxiety of I could actually do worse. So when I say to kids, you can only earn the points back, you can't lose the points you've already gained. I think that takes away some anxiety. They're also doing the retake outside of the classroom environment and my win with just a very small group of kids. So it takes them out of that typical testing environment too. Um, so I think I removed some of the anxiety from that. I'm also of the mind of do the corrections with me as well. So I don't, I don't want them to walk out of the room with the test. Come do the corrections with me here. So that way I can see that you're actually referencing your notes or actually legitimately asking me questions if you are legitimately having issues with a certain concept. And I know that it's 100% your work. And they can work in small groups in my win. I have no problem with them collaborating either on the test uh, correction piece of that. But when it comes to the actual retake, that's your individual, you showing me what you've learned, not what everybody around you has learned. Because that is where your grade's coming from. It's your individual, what do you know, not what did you collaborate with and learn from. I also understand we're in the photo math and chat GPT era, era. So I don't know if that test walks out, if that's getting scanned and then photo math is doing it for them and explaining all the steps or if chat GPT is doing it for them. So having them do it with me in that smaller environment shows me that they're doing it legitimately and also that it's them showing their mastery of the skill. Um, I don't make any of my students to retakes. I encourage them and I tell them it's, it's about you and showing off what you know. Um, and so I just, I turn it back on them. Um, but students who struggles, I tell them, you know what? It's my job to help you not struggle. It's my job to make sure that you know this if you want to retake it. But um, you also have to show the initiative and say, I need support, you know? So it's like teaching my middle schoolers how to self-advocate along with being like, I will help you self-advocate too, though, even if you're not ready for it, you know? Um, and so giving them the chance to do retakes, giving them the chance to learn before retakes actually brings down a lot of their anxiety and saying that it is about them and not about me um, lets them realize that, you know what, if I'm really happy with where I am, then I'm happy where I am. But if I want to do more, I can do more. Yeah, I just want to piggyback and say I don't force retakes either, <laughs> but I do highly encourage the kids that really didn't do well on it. And especially I'll email home too that, hey, you got this opportunity, let's take advantage of it. But yeah, I never force retakes. If, they wanted, if a kid got a 70 and they're happy with their 70, leave it. But yeah, I don't force the retake on anybody. Yeah, Julie, I, I agree with you. Um, I've been in parent meetings where they didn't even realize it was an option. And uh, then when I let them know, they go, oh, hold on one second. And then immediately they are no longer mad at me. <laughs> and they get upset with their, their child, uh, which actually brings me to the final question. Um, how do we help critics and parents understand the why behind either retakes or corrections. And sometimes it's the same person, the critic is the parent, but how do we help them understand the why we are either giving a correction or giving a retake? And I'm gonna start with, with Mandy and Richard. I think above all, I would like to de-emphasize performance and grades and really put the emphasis on learning and understanding. And we want to communicate that what you know, what you come to understand, 
that should be what your grade reflects. And so you need opportunities to have opportunities to show your understanding, to show growth in your understanding over time. That all matters. And so multiple opportunities to show what you know, to show the growth, to show the reflection on your learning and thinking. So ultimately, I would like everyone to think about learning as an ongoing process that happens at different points in time for different learners. But ultimately, we're trying to represent what someone understands, not trying to average points or something like that. Yeah, and I would also want to emphasize to critics, uh, you know, and to naysayers of whether it be for test corrections or retakes, it's about the students, um, you know, overall well-being, which includes their mental well-being and their mental health as well. And I would probably, you know, explain to them the data that shows that math anxiety is really high in a lot of students because of the pressures of society and wanting to get into really good colleges and there's, you know, they work so hard to try to achieve a certain grade or, you know, you know, meet certain things because we're always told that they were going to fail maybe and they just aren't doing so well. So I think being able to explain clearly to them that what we're trying to do is to grow them personally as a human being, not just for the sake of learning mathematics, but by doing this, like, you know, test corrections, uh, retaking tests gives them the opportunity to know that they can do it. I think that self-efficacy, just that self-motivation will not just prepare them to become good mathematicians, but future, you know, lifelong learners. Um, again, that's kind of jumping off of what Mandy was saying. So I think that's important. I think to know that they can be a math person and that they are a math person, that it's it's really in just this sense of hope and giving as a teacher, I think, is more important. Richard's answer is better than mine. I love all of that that you said about your identity and their sense of self. Brilliant. He rough drafted that. That's okay. <laughs> I did. Uh, and I did. To, uh, <laughs> to the other side, actually, May, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, you know, how do we talk with naysayers and critics and, and parents, well, sometimes the same person, about, uh, you know, with test retakes? Yeah, I go back to like making mistakes and getting second chances, right? How many of us? deserve and want a second or a third chance at something. And, and especially when it comes to our own learning, right? If I'm like, oops, I didn't understand it the first time or it wasn't my best. Wouldn't you want to also be given the chance to be like, okay, you can do it again and show me something better. And so I think for parents and anybody who says like test corrections or test retakes aren't how real life is, I think it is what real life is. How many, you know, we all have gotten second chances or third chances or we all got a chance to just improve even if we did it the first time i'm still able to improve on what i did um and so i think it's not even about like becoming an adult because that's what we do as adults take second chances take their chances and now it's our job to teach students to take those chances right because it goes back to i think rob you were saying how like the parents didn't know yeah parents would get mad at me be like well i didn't know they could retake it be like mm, they can and your child is not taking that opportunity and so that's a different life scale and different life, like, moral to learn. And Julie? Yeah, I'm just going to piggyback on what she said. I think life is full of second chances, but I think a lot of life is performance-based, unfortunately. I go back to the driver test example, but also my daughter, she's been stuck at the same level of swim class forever because she has not passed the test that shows she's met all the skills to go to the next level, and that's a safety thing. So I'm okay with her having to retake that same swimming test 50,000 times as long as I know she will then be fully ready to go to that next level and learn a new swim stroke and she'll be 100% safe doing it because she learned all those skills leading up to it. So I do think life is has some performance-based skills that kids need to learn and one of those is a test-taking skill and I agree that kids have certain tests that they can only take once like a final exam but there's also like the SAT that they can retake every month until they get the score that they want or the ACT where they could take every month until they get the score that they want. But those test taking skills are super important for them to still learn. And I think they do need to do more test taking rather than less. And a retake is a safe way in my mind of practicing those test taking skills. All right. And I think that concludes our questioning round. We will now end by giving each side two minutes to make their final arguments to you. And we will begin with May. May? You have two minutes. Go ahead. So on as team retakes, um, 
What we like to say to all of you is that retakes is a really great way for our students to show mastery in an isolated situation. We know it's their work. We know it is their thinking. We know that they've used whatever they've learned from us and any feedback we've given them to show what they know. Um, and one of the best parts about doing the retakes is like they can't get a lower grade. Like in our two classrooms and our two schools, what their grade was before, they can only do better. So it is a great confidence booster. It relieves a lot of anxiety for students. Um, in addition, you know, if a student doesn't do well, sometimes they do um, great on a different part, right? I could just see them, wait, well, hey, they didn't get this part correct the first time, but the second time, even though their grade did not improve, they still got to correct here. So we're still seeing growth. We're still seeing learning. Um, so, you know, if students are allowed to do retakes, we would love them to do it because it is their work and we get to honor them and we get to honor their timeline as to when they need to, at the time, the amount of time they need in order to learn what they're supposed to learn. Thank you. And with the final words, we have Richard and Mandy. So we are on tests, uh, team test corrections, and we argue for test cor uh, corrections leading to mastery because it gives the opportunity for students to enhance their self-efficacy in mathematics. It gives them the motivation to want to pinpoint and find their mistakes to work on the processes rather than the, the final answer. So to us, it's more important that the students go on this journey rather than reaching that destination. We feel that giving them um, the opportunity to correct their tests helps shape uh, their mathematical identities as well uh, so that they feel that they are uh, math people and that they can indeed do mathematics. Um, and lastly, we feel that giving them test corrections offers them a sense of hope and being able to kind of get out of this rut of, oh, maybe I can't do it, but there is a way for me to, to get better. I may not understand it right now, but I will understand it eventually later. And I think also adding in this layer of we learn from reflecting on our experiences. And so that sense of really giving students a chance to articulate what they understood before and what they're understanding now after that experience of correcting, I think enhances their overall sense of what makes sense to them in math. Excellent. Thank you all. That concludes this wonderful debate. You've given us lots of insights, lots of food for thought. I hope this gives some teachers out there some ideas to think about and maybe some arguments if they want to pursue one or both of these options. And now it is up to our listeners to take a moment, ponder the arguments, share with friends, and consider what resonated with you. Be sure to go to our Twitter, at TheMaveMathPod, to share your thoughts on this debate. Which do you prefer, retakes or corrections? And huge thanks to all four of our guests. You were so thoughtful and respectful. You, you came up for, uh, Oh, from different sides of this, uh, but you were so uh, willing to listen and, and respond to each other. And that was wonderful. And again, thanks to those who are listening. We hope you enjoyed this and learned a lot from it. And so as we wrap up, Julie, where can listeners find you? Find me on Twitter. My handle is at edtechmathteach um, or on Facebook, find Julianne. And May, where can listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at vangmay1. And then you can also find me on Facebook at maybangswatson. Mandy, where can listeners find you? Well, my Twitter handle is at Mandy Math Ed. And if you want to think more about revising, the first chapter of Rough Draft Math is on the Stenhouse website for free. Check that out. And Richard, where can listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter at RCLDelasco. Perfect. Thank you all. Want to learn more about incorporating debate activities into your math classroom? Go to lozniak.com slash podcast to sign up for my mailing list and get your first set of example debate activities you could use with your students today. Go to lozniak.com slash podcast. Don't forget to reach out to us with comments and questions on debatemath.com or follow us on Twitter at debatemathpod and follow along with hashtag debatemathpod. Rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this podcast. Your feedback is super important to us. Well, that's all from us. Looking forward to debating with you more next episode. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.